Um, so my name is Kyle Whistle. I run Whistle Realty Group powered by EXP down here in San Diego. Uh, I've been in the real estate space for half of my life now, which is kind of crazy. So I started out, bought my first property at 20. Uh, I'll be coming up on 40 here in a couple years. So it's kind of crazy. Um, but our team down here, we've got about 30 agents on our team now, and we've got 10 admins on our team. We'll sell north of 300 houses in San Diego this year. Uh, which is amazing. So that's who I am on the business side. Um, on the personal side, I am married for seven years now. I've got a beautiful three-year-old daughter and we have pet pot-bellied pigs. And our passion project is rescuing pot-bellied pigs. Nice. So uh, how, many, how many pigs do you have? Uh, two at the house and about a dozen at our ranch, which is uh, just up the hill. We have a five-acre ranch that I bought purely so that we could rescue pot-bellied pigs. Nice. Yeah. And, and And I think that it's cool that who cares what you're passionate about? If you're passionate about do it, there's too many people that are just doing so many things that they hate. Yeah. And that's why everything else sucks in their life. I'm all about passion, baby. Sweet. So we're talking about team building and you said that, you have 30 agents or so now, um, but obviously you didn't start with 30 agents. It, it took you, you know, some steps and it took you, you know, some things that worked, some things that didn't work. Um, can you kind of outline from where you started to where you're at today, uh, maybe one or two things that you would do differently when building a team? That's the easier part to talk about what you screwed up, right? Because we all made <laughs> You're like, mistakes. oh, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. I remember. Oh, we, we remember the mistakes. <laughs> yeah, my first year I lost over $100,000. And so how I kind of got to building teams, I probably actually lost way more than that in opportunity costs, but hard costs, I lost over a hundred grand. Um, so when I got in the business, I got into the residential side of things during the short sale and REO days. And we got to the point, we started landing some of the big REO accounts with HUD and Fannie Mae and, and some of those big um, asset management companies out there. And I had tons and tons of listings. And then there were all these buyer leads that were coming in from them. And I initially was like, hey, my buddy's a broker. I'm just going to like send these leads over to him and he can let his agents try to follow up on them. And so once a week, I would export all of the leads that came in for the week and send them over to him. Be like, here, see if you can convert these. Like, think about that today. <laughs> we're like, now I'm obsessing over how many seconds it takes to follow up. And I was batching them out leads once a <laughs> week. Like, it was so stupid. Um, and then I tried having a couple agents who were under me. And I was just like, all right, you two are going to get all these leads. But I had no systems or anything. I was just like, all right, here's the lead. Go for it. Convert it. There was no role playing. There was no systems. There was no CRM. There was nothing. I was just like, all right, guys, here's leads. At least I went from like a week to like a day. Um, but still, there was no system or anything for these guys to follow. And then after throwing away who knows how many leads and how many probably hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of opportunity, um, I finally got to the point where I was like, all right, this is just not working. Like I need to step this up. And so um, I was sitting around on a Black Friday one day and computers were on sale at Dell for like 200 bucks. And I was just like, F it. Like, it's time to go big. Like, I'm sick of playing small. I've got these leads. Like, let's just dive in head first. And so I bought 10 computers and I had a hundred square foot office at this time. It was just me and an assistant and these two guys who just kind of like randomly showed up. <laughs> um, and so I bought all these computers and I was like, all right, cool. Now I got 10 computers. Now I need an office. So then I went and I found like a 2000 square foot office. And I was like, all right, I got 10 computers. I got an office. Now I need people. And initially I just went out and I hired anybody and everybody. Like if they could fog a mirror, it was like getting a loan, right? They fogged a mirror, they got hired. Um, and I had people from like 18 to 80 years old. Um, and so I had all different walks of life, all different strengths, all different weaknesses. And that first year I lost well over a hundred thousand dollars. And I quickly learned that I can't be the right fit for everybody. I started to understand what culture is and the fact that we had to hire the culture first. Um, and so really starting to understand who our culture was. We are very young. We're very, very tech savvy. Um, we're very, very aggressive with everything that we do. And we really started to implement the systems and the support and the structure that was needed to take all those leads that I used to throw away and now have the systems of support and the structure to actually convert all of those. And so not that an older agent can't be successful. They just weren't successful within our culture. I mean, my number two agent in the city where we are right now in San Diego, he's 70 years old. He goes out and door knocks every day and he loves it and he kills it with that. 
Um, so it's not to say somebody older can't be successful. It's just not the right fit for our culture. So once we really identified who we were, um, young, tech savvy, and aggressive, and we started hiring people around that, we went from 82 deals to 242 deals in a single year. And it was just because of the people. It wasn't because of like, oh, we just flipped some magic switch and all of a sudden these deals started happening. We really learned what our culture was, brought in the right people first, and then second, put the systems, the support, and the structure in place. So now when a lead came in, we knew what to do with it because we were putting the time in and we were role-playing what to do when the lead came in. We were role-playing what to do at the actual presentation, which is an area I see most agents make a huge mistake is, you know, we're in an industry where we can make NFL money. Like we brought in $5 million in GCI last year, over 10 million in the last two years combined. Like that's literally NFL money, but it's because we put the NFL effort in and most people aren't doing that. They're just showing up They're They're spending all this money on leads, but they don't know what to do with the leads when they come in. And every once in a while, there's some agents who role play and they actually know like what to say to the lead. So they know how to take a lead from a lead to an appointment. But the thing, I've been in rooms of 500 people before and ask, how many of you guys role play your presentation at least once a week? And I've never seen more than 5% of the room raise their hand. That's been the most. That means 95 out of 100 agents, and these are rooms of, of high producers, 95 out of 100 aren't role playing the presentation. So you're spending all this money on leads, and then you're spending all this time converting those leads to appointments, but then you show up to the appointment and shit the bed because you don't know what to say. Like, what's the point? And so we really started to make an effort to put in that role play, put in that practice, just like the guys in the NFL do. I mean, those guys are practicing 2,000 hours a year for 16 games a year that they're only on the field half the game. So 2,000 hours of practice for eight hours of game time, we need to do that same thing in our business. So we obsess over role play. We role play on the phone every single day, and we role play our presentations in the office every single week. Um, and then we support our agents in everything that we do. And so we're really big and we've got a sales manager who helps them out with the negotiations and with our contracts and everything like that. Um, and then what I look at my job as is in fishing, there's this thing called fish spotting. So traditionally, like when you go fishing, you go out in a boat and you kind of just put around all day looking like here in San Diego, we go tuna fishing. And so you're looking for like kelp patties or you're looking for like birds diving or you're looking for like fish uh, breaking the surface and you put around all day looking for this stuff. You could do that. Or now there's companies that go fish spotting. And so they fly around in airplanes and they look for these things and you pay a subscription to these companies. And they're like, Hey, there's a kelp patty here. Hey, there's birds diving here. Hey, there's fish breaking the water here. Now you just go straight to where that is and the fish are going to be there. So instead of putting around all day, wasting fuel and, you know, just being bored out of your mind and hoping you might catch a fish. Now there's, companies that do the fish spotting for you tell you where the fish are going to be and you can go straight to it. That's what I look at my job as I'm the fish spotter for my team. So I got to go out there. I got to find the fish. I got to put my team on the fish and then we got to have the support and the structure for them to convert those leads. So you talked about quite a few things there for somebody that's, uh, doesn't have the right culture. Cause you said culture was super huge. And you know, that was something that when you initially jumped into it, you didn't necessarily have a plan around that for somebody that does have a team currently that they have a few of those people that are just, you know, hurting everything around the office. Nobody wants to come in. Nobody wants to talk to that person. This person's talking drama on that person. What are your, what's your advice to that, that team leader that's, that has those uh, people on their team? Fire them all. I mean, if your if your shop is a hot mess and you just you know it, just fire everybody, and then open up an application process and see who wants to come back and be a part of it. And I know that's scary as hell to think about, like cutting everybody because you're so freaked out over how much money you're going to lose by firing everybody. You are going to make yourself five times as much money, probably ten times as much money, by getting rid of those culture sucking vampires that are on your team but don't deserve to be on your team, don't fit within your team. Um, so just fire everybody. I've been there. Just clean house. <laughs> like sometimes you need to do that. It's okay to do that and just start from scratch. There's a point where you're keep trying to fix it and keep trying to fix it. Just start all over. Like we're so big now. That's, that's a whole nother animal. But I mean, if you got a team of four or five people, just cut them all and then come like take a uh, time and understand what is your culture. Go back through all of your reviews online and see what people are writing about you. Ask other agents, what do they think about when they think about your team? Ask some of your clients, hey, when you think about Whistle Realty Group, what do you think of? What comes to mind? 
you'll actually learn what your culture is. And you'll be like, oh, that is us. Oh, that is us. And then, you know, sit there and, and make like a word cloud and look at all these words that come up over and over again. And then, you know, you still need to, as a leader, you got to be the one who comes up with what those core values are um, because it's got to be, it's you, right? Like I've done an exercise before, and this is another mistake I've made, is where I put my whole team in a room and let them come up with what our core values were. Well, guess what? 90% of those people aren't with us anymore. <laughs> Why should my core values have been defined by people that aren't with me anymore? So can they have input? For sure. But should they be able to define the core values? No, you're the leader. You got to define the core values. What do you want to lead to? Um, don't lead to what other people want. Lead to what you want, what you're passionate about. So when having a team, you definitely want to look at culture. But for somebody that doesn't have a team, they're on, they're on their own. They're thinking about starting a team. Who would their first hire so if you don't have an assistant, you are the assistant. That's always the first hire. That's the most logical one. But a good admin is one of the most important parts of a team. They're the, literally the glue that holds the team together. You've got to have a really good solid admin. Um, the exercise that we like to do, we call it stoplight. And so when you're by yourself, you're the only person, you don't have an assistant or anything, just spend a week and outline every single thing that you do every 30 minutes. And this is what I do. Okay, I printed out my stuff for my showings. I scheduled the showings. I showed the property. Um, I came back. I wrote the offer. I did this. I did this. Like literally outline everything you do on a 30-minute basis. So over the course of a week, you should have about 80 different things that you did, right? For those 30 minutes times 40 hours. Hopefully, you're putting 40 plus hours. And then go through that list. And Wait, then, you're supposed to work as a real estate agent? A little bit. <laughs> a little bit. That's the, that is the secret to success, right? If you guys want the secret to success, it's just fucking work. That's it. Just work. Um but take that, right? And everything that you love to do and you always want to do and never want to stop doing, highlight that in green. Everything that you hate to do and never want to do again, highlight it in red. And then everything else is yellow. And that red, that's the initial job description for that first hire. And now you take away all the things that you don't like to do that are time-sucking vampires. Like you get rid of that. But that's that initial job description for the assistant. And then as the assistant gets more proficient, you can start adding some of those yellow tasks on there. Um, until you get to the point where it's more than they can handle and you can bring on another admin. You just kind of go through that stoplight exercise over and over again. But I would never build a team until I have a solid admin in place. You've got to have that admin. They're the glue that holds it together. Um, other mistakes I see people make is they see a team like ours. So my personal team is 12 people. The, the whole Whistle Realty group is, is like 30 people total. Um, but they'll see like, oh, Kyle's got 12 people on his team. I'm going to go hire 12 people. Like, no, don't hire 12 <laughs> people. You do not. That's so damn hard to manage. Um, at most, I would bring in three to four people initially, no more, um, and start with that core group. And if you hire four, two of them aren't going to work. It's just inevitable. And it might be that they're not the right fit for you. You're not the right fit for them. There's, it's just inevitable that that's going to happen. So we do like to bring people in in groups, um, a minimum of two agents, a maximum of four agents. Um, I found it's good to bring people in together because they kind of um, sync up with each other. They always become good friends because they went through training together and they've kind of learned everything together and they tend to be really good accountability partners and their skill sets tend to be similar because they've had the same amount of time in the business. So they tend to compete against each other a lot, which is fun too. Um, so bring in two to four people, but don't start to add more people until you need them. Uh, a lot of people are not making enough money in their business. So they're like, oh man, I better go hire more agents. And then they start losing more money. Like, I got to hire more agents. I got It's like racking up credit card debt, right? Like you're, you're just paying off your debt with credit cards that are at higher interest rates and you're actually compounding the problem. You shouldn't be hiring more people until you need more people. And I think that's a huge mistake that people make. So if you, you know, and we like to think about 30 leads per agent per month is kind of an ideal number. If you start to give them more than that, you either uh, flood them with too many leads um, or they stop appreciating the leads that you're giving them. So you don't want to give agents too many leads. Okay, well, let's say I've got two agents and I've got 40 leads a month coming in. I don't need to hire anybody else. But if I've got 70 leads coming in, 80 leads coming in a month, now maybe I need to hire some more people. So hire when you need to grow. Don't hire to try to, to fill some void of, of financial income that you get because you're just going to make things worse. Oh,